Hello teachers, let's start a new chapter. Chapter 7, decimals, percents, and real numbers. And in section 7-1, we're going to talk about terminating decimals. So at the end of this section, you'll be able to understand and explain decimal notation, connections between fractions and decimals using various models and strategies, why terminating decimals occur, and how to tell if a decimal will terminate, or keep going, and ordering of terminating decimals. All right, what in the world's a decimal? The word decimal comes from the Latin decim, meaning 10. Now, that might make you think of December. And that I know that's the 12th month, but originally it wasn't. It was the 10th month. Just like November means 9, Octo, as in October, means 8, Sept means 7, um, so, the Latin root for 10 is decim, or decim, I'm not sure the way to pronunciate, per, to pronunciate it, but decimal is base 10. The decimal number system has it at its base the number 10. We can represent the decimal number 12.61873. Now, notice that I did that. I'm going to try not to do this again, but we really should not read it as 12 decimal point six one eight seven three we'll talk about that as we go through as a matter of fact let's talk about it now you remember how you should read this it's 12 and so the decimal place is and and then you have sixty one thousand eight hundred seventy three and how do you figure out what place that's in remember we count over tenths the six is in the tenths the one is in the hundredths, the eight is in the thousandths, the seven is in the ten thousandths, and the three is in the hundred thousandths place. So it's got it typed up right down here at the bottom of the screen. It says the number is read 12 and, and again, an and is a decimal place in math. When you read a number, the only time you say and is for a decimal place, no other time. 12 and 61,873 hundred thousandths. And so we really, even in our mind, we really should get in the habit of reading that the proper way because the decimal really is just a fraction. So again, this 12.61873, that's the lazy man's way of reading that. It's 12 and 61,873. So promise me you will read every decimal in the proper way from now on. Now, how do you write that in expanded form? So notice it, the 1 is in the tenths place, so we write 1 times 10. The 2 is in the 1 place, so 2 times 1. Remember, we expanded whole numbers in a previous section like this. The six is in the tens place, so six tenths. The one is in the hundredths place, but we can write that is one over ten to the second power. And then you can write it as eight over ten to the third power, which is the thousandths place. Four over ten to the fourth power, which is the ten thousandths place later. And then... Uh, 3 over 10 to the 5th power. I don't know if you saw that on my screen, but it wants me to restart my computer. And absolutely not right now. I'm busy. So that is expanded form. You could also write those as decimals to the negative power. Let me write this out while we're at it. Instead of writing 10 to the 1st in the denominator, I could write that as 10 to the negative 1 times 10 to the negative 2 times 10 to the negative 3 times 10 to the negative 4, times 10 to the negative 5. Of course, you wouldn't write it in the bottom also. So that is another way of expanding decimals. All right, the next page we've talked about. Each place of a decimal may be named by its power of 10. So again, this number down here, we're going to read it the right way this time, right? 128 and... 95 hundredths, okay? So again, a one is in the hundreds place, two is in the tens place, eight is in the ones place. The decimal point is read and. The only time you read a an and in mathematics when you're reading a number is at a decimal point. And then you have 95 and that five is in the hundredths place. Now, while I'm thinking about it, I see this all the time, especially with children. 
say for instance this number that is not 100 and 23 it's just not right the only time again you read an and when you read a number is in the decimal place that is the number 100 23 not 100 and 23 if you happen to be one of those people that that does that just because you've heard other people do it stop yourself <laughs> okay and is only for the decimal place now we're going to talk about the blocks again right the base 10 blocks but we're going to redefine them notice it says suppose that along in base 10 block set represents the one unit so this whole thing that's going to be a one and they, they happen to have one, two, three, four, five of them. So that's five ones. And now we're going to use the unit blocks that we used for ones in the past as the tenths place. Okay, so if this is going to be ones, that's five ones and then four tenths. So we read that five and four tenths. Again, not 5.4, .4, right? Nope, that's not a thing. This is five and four tenths. Okay, and you see that that would be 54 cubes, which would be 54 tenths, because all those little individual blocks are tenths. And 5 and 4 tenths is equivalent to 54 tenths. It's also equivalent, let's point this out, to 5, uh-oh, let's get your pen working, to 5, still not working, Hold on, I'm sorry, it's frustrating. To five and four tenths. Is 54 tenths the same as five and four tenths the same as five and four tenths there? Sure it is. Now, if you wrote this in fraction form, we would need to reduce it, but I'm not going to right now because we're comparing that to the decimal version of that. All right. To represent de a decimal such as 2 and 235 thousandths, we can think of a block as a unit. So this time we're not going to use a long as a unit. We're going to use that big giant block with how many of those are in there? There's a thousand units in there, right? So if we wanted to represent 2 and 235 thousandths, we would have 2, that's to represent our whole number 2, and then we've got 200, remember the flats have 100 in there, so that would be 200, and then 35 thousandths. So these base 10 blocks can be used for a lot, right? You just redefine what your values are equal to. All right, got an example. Now we're supposed to convert the following numbers to decimals, okay? So we're going to start with 25 tenths. Now that's an improper fraction, isn't it? And you're supposed to say, well, yes, of course it is, Miss Wilson, because the numerator is bigger than the denominator. So what if we changed that to a mixed fraction? And you know how we can do that. We can say 10 divides into 25, two whole times. Two times 10 is, is uh, 20, and then we subtract can carry it away here, subtract, and that re leaves a remainder of 5. And then how do we write that as a mixed number? We remember it's quotient, and then remainder over divisor. Now, I know that reduces to 1 half, but you know what? We don't want to reduce it to 1 half. To write a decimal, you need a base 10 number in the denominator, always. So I could write this as 2, and is my decimal place, and there's the 5 tenths right there. Now, I'm going to show you the typed up version, which I warned you is going to be different than what I just did. Does that make mine wrong or make this one wrong? Absolutely not. You know, that, you know, just like me, there's more than one way to get this job done. Let's see if we can follow what they did. Okay, and notice they left the tenths in the denominator because we need a base 10 in the denominator. In the numerator, they wrote 25 as 2 times 10. The idea is to get that 10 to cancel in just a minute. And then there's five left over. Then they split the fraction. Notice it's split into two separate fractions, two times 10 over 10 and five over 10. Now, the two times 10 over 10, the tens 
divide out. You cancel common factors, and you're left with the whole number 2 and 5 tenths, and that's where we get the whole 2 and 5 tenths. I'm feeling a little better about my way because they did this previously when they changed an improper fraction to a mixed number, but I like the division algorithm for doing that. I, I just think it's easier to understand. Uh, 56 hundredths, that's the way you would read this fraction, right? That means that's a proper fraction, which means the whole number part is zero. And then you have 56 hundredths. Now we got to make sure that six lands in the hundredths place. And it does. Remember, this is the ones place where there's a zero and. And then the five is in the tenths place and the six is in the hundredths place. Again, their version of this is just exactly what we did without writing anything down. So 0 0.56. How about 205 ten thousandths? Okay. Well, here's what I know. This is a proper fraction. You agree? So what does that mean? That means there's a zero in the ones place for sure. Now, if I just write 205 over here, I'm going to be wrong because this is tenths, hundreds, thousands. But that five is supposed to land in the ten thousandths place. So eh, wrong. This is going to be zero. Now, to get that 5 to land in the tens thousandths place, which is 4 over, I'm going to need 0 to 0, 5. And when you read that, it is 0 and the number 205, because anything to the left, you don't actually read that 0. 205, and then that's ten thousandths, tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths. Okay, how'd they explain it? They didn't. They just wrote it out, right? Now let's look at example number two. Express each of the following as decimals. Notice the directions are the same. But whoo, this looks different, right? Now, I know what you're thinking. Maybe I know what you're thinking. You want to go to your calculator and do seven divided by two to the sixth. And that would honestly work. But that is not going to help your students understand what's going on. This is really, I agree, 7 divided by 2 to the 6th. And if you were to do that in a calculator, you will get the answer we're about to come up with. But instead of that, I want to handle this a different way. Remember, we need a base 10 number in the denominator to talk about decimals. We don't have a base 10 number. We have a base 2 number. So watch this fun trick. We know 2 times 5 is 10, right? So I'm going to multiply this denominator not by 5 but by 5 to the 6th because I have a 2 to the 6th so I want this this exponent to match that one so I can get the 10 that I need out of there so that's 5 to the 6th but I have to multiply by 5 to the 6th in the numerator also because I need to multiply by 1 I don't want to change the value of my problem okay so this is 7 times 5 to the 6th in the numerator. And in the denominator, that 2 times 5 is 10, and that's to the 6th power. And the only way I could multiply those two together, am I allowed to do that, is because these are both raised to the same power. If this was 2 to the 6th and this was 5 to the 1st, I couldn't do that. I would have to pull out a 2 to the 1st to be able to multiply by 5 to the 1st. Now, what should I do next? Well... We still might need to pull in the calculator. Here's the problem. I don't really want to multiply 7 times 5 to the 6th by hand. I could, you could, we all could. It would just take a few minutes, so bear with me. We know we could do this, but we don't want to do it. We don't want to do it by hand. So 5 to the 6th, by the way, is 15,625 times 7 is 109,000. 375, and that's over 10 to the 6. Now, no reason to multiply that 10 to the 6 out. All right. Whoo. Now, notice that that goes out six places. Therefore, our number is 0 point, okay, so 0 and 109, 109, 309,375, what? 10 to the 6th, so that is, what is that? 
Hundred thousandths? Millionths? That's millionths, right? It's a one and six zero. Now, is that five in the millionths place? Tenths, hundreds, thousandths, ten thousand, hundred thousandths, millionths? It sure is. So, zero and 109,375 millionths. How about you pause it and try the next one? Now, how's the next one going for you? So, I've got one over two to the third times five to the fourth. Now, remember, we can't use that fun trick of 2 times 5 is 10 because these don't have the same power. So, how am I going to handle this? Well, let's, let's pair up what we can. So, I'm going to say this is 1 over 2 to the 3rd times 5 to the 3rd times a leftover 5. That is 5 to the 4th, right? Because there's really a 1 right there. Now, that you know what? That 2 to the 3rd times 5 to the 3rd, I'm allowed to put those 2 times 5 together and write that as 10 to the 3rd. But that 5 to the 1st, he's just hanging, and he needs a 2 friend, okay? So I'm going to multiply by 2 to the 1st in the denominator and a 2 to the 1st in the numerator also. Well, what is that going to give me? That's going to give me 2 in the numerator, because 1 times 2 to the 1st is 2. And in the denominator, I have a 10 to the 3rd, and now I have another 10 to the 1st, which is really, remember you add those exponents when you multiply bases, 10 to the 4th. So how do I write this in decimal form? Now, first of all, this again is a proper fraction. The numerator is smaller than the denominator, way smaller, so this is 0. Now, that 2 has to land in the, what is 10 to the 4th? Well, that's a 1 and 4 zeros. That's the 10 thousandths place. So that 2 must land in the 10 thousandths place. So there's a 0 in the tenths, a 0 in the hundredths, a 0 in the thousandths, and there's my 2 in the 10 thousandths place in that fourth position. Just like that 5 that was right here was in the sixth position, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There we go. That's an easy way to think about it. And there is your decimal. Again, that is read 0 and 2 ten thousandths. Now, let's look at the uh, typed up version of this. Make sure we handled it the same way. I think we probably handle it very similar. So, the first one, again, we're just revisiting 2 to the 6th. We need a 10 down there. So, we multiplied by 5 to the 6th over 5 to the 6th. And then they miraculously said 5 to the 6th is 5,625. That's when I cheated and grabbed my calculator because I just didn't want to do that by hand. I'm sure you don't either. And then 7 times that number gave me 109,375. And in the denominator, that 2 times 5 to the 6th, and again, you have 0 and 109,375 millionths. Okay, and then let's look at their version of the one that we just did. They took 2 to the 3rd times 5 to the 4th times 2 to the 1st. That works. They just multiplied by 2 to the 1st, and they put it with that one. Now, I paired mine up first. We just did it in a reverse first order. Is that okay? Well, of course it is, right? So 2 times 5 to the 4th is 10 to the 4th. That, again, means that 2 in the numerator has to land in that 4th spot. So you've got your answer just like we got. Now I've got another one. Okay, what about 1 divided by 125? Now there's two different ways to handle this. One thought, and there's nothing wrong with this thought, this is not the way the book does it, so I'm going to show you the other way. I'm thinking I need some kind of base 10 down here. So what if I multiply this fraction by 4 over 4? Would that, would that work? No, not 4 over 4. How about 8 over 8? Why, why did I say 8 over 8? First of all, say, why did I say 4 over 4? Because I didn't multiply right. That we know 125 times 8. If you multiply that out, 125 times 8 is 1,000. So that would give me 8 over 1,000, which means that's 8 thousandths, which would be 0 because it's a proper fraction, tenths, hundreds, thousands. That eight goes in the thousands. Now, that is not the way the book did it. Okay, let me show you that. 
All right, so instead, let's go back to where we started. 1 over 125, or 1 and 125, 125th. I can't even say it. Okay, now, how do I write that as a prime factorization? Well, you might recognize that that's 1 over 5 to the third. What if you didn't recognize that? Well, we take 125. You know where you go with this, right? It's 5 times 25. 25 breaks down into 5 times 5, and that's where I got that 5 to the third from. Okay, so break down whatever your denominator is into prime factors. Now, remember what we were doing. If it's a 5 down there, we were turning that into a 10. So I'm going to multiply by what I'm missing. I would like a 2 to the third in the denominator, so I'm going to put another 2 to the third in the numerator. You know, this fraction in green over here is just 1. I'm allowed to do that. So that gives me 1 times 2 to the third is 2 to the third. And in the denominator, 5 times 2 is 10, and that is to the third power. Okay, keep going. 2 to the third is 8. 10 to the third, if you wanted to write that out, you could, but why not just leave it as 10 to the third, which will give me 0, because it's a proper fraction, and then 0, 0, 8, because again, that 8 is going to end up in the third position over. That make pretty good sense? Again, that is not 0 0.008, right? We're the laziest people ever that say that. That 0 and... Eight thousandths, right? Yes, sometimes I have to still count over. Let's look at the books versions of these things. So the first one, notice they prime factorization, 5 to the third in the denominator. They wrote that as 1 over 5 to the third times 2 to the third over 2 to the third. Again, they just multiplied by 1, so we get a 10, base 10 in the denominator, so that 5 times 2 gives us the 10. They're both to the third place. 2 to the third is 8. There we go. Let's look at the next version. So, we didn't do that problem. Oh, let's back up. My apologies. <laughs> we took that, all that space just to do the first problem. Eek! Okay, so the next problem. Let's take a look at that. You don't remember what we just had up there, do you? So 25, 250, I'm going to break that down into 25 times 10. Why? Because I want the prime factorization of this. 25 is 5 times 5. 10 is 2 times 5. So this can be written as 7 over 200, not 250, 2 to the first times 5 to the third. You follow all that? Okay. Now, I see a 10 in there. That's 7 over 2 to the first times 5 to the first. There's a 10 right there, but I still have a 5 to the second left over. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to multiply by what I want. So that's going to be 2 to the second in the bottom and a 2 to the second in the numerator up there. What's that going to do? Well, that's 7 times 4. It's 28. And in the denominator, this is a 10 to the first right here, and this is a 10 to the second right next to it, which gives me 28 in the numerator, and that's 10 to the third in the denominator. Remember what we said, that 8 has to land in that third position, so this is 0, 0, 2, 8. In other words, 28 thousandths. Now let's look at their version. Now, let's see if they solved that second one the way that we did this together. So, they broke down 250. Huh, look at that square over there. That came from my previous page. I don't really know why it's there. But anyway, <laughs> ignore the square. It shouldn't be there. So, 250. Prime factorization is 2 times 5 to the third. Just do a factor tree. All right, they wrote... 2 times 5 to the third times a 2 to the second. So they did this a little different. I tend to pull one out and get matchies, and they just go ahead and try to match up. Theirs is probably more efficient. So then you have 2 times 5 to the third, and on the top you have 28, and that would give you, again, 0 and 28 thousandths. 
let's talk about terminating decimals. Decimals that can be written with only a finite number of places. That means it doesn't go on and on and on forever. It terminates. It stops. The finite number of places to the right of the decimal point are called terminating decimals. A rational number A over B in simplest form can be written as a terminating decimal if and only if, this is super important, the prime factorization of the denominator contains no primes other than 2 or 5. You kind of got that pattern from the last few problems we did, right? Every time we broke down those numbers into prime factorizations, we were pairing up 2s and 5s together. And you could have just 2s or just 5s, and you can multiply in the 2s and 5s you need. But if you have any other prime numbers, then that decimal is not going to terminate. Now you can take a look at some examples here of terminating versus non-terminating decimals. So the first column, it says, can be written as terminating decimals. Why? Because this denominator of 16 can be written as prime factorization of 2 to the 4th, which, remember, 2 or 5 or a combination of 2 and 5, is terminating decimals. Any other prime factorization will not be terminating. So 40, you know, if you break down 40, it's 2 to the third times 5. Again, combination of 2s and 5s, just 2s and just 5s is fine as well. And 160 breaks down in 2 to the fifth times 5, and all of those will be terminating. On the other hand, the other column, 18, breaks down into 2 times 3 squared. Therefore, this cannot be written as terminating decimal. 26 breaks down into 2 times 13. Again, the 13 is the problem, not the 2. The 13 is the problem. And 84 breaks down into 2 squared times 3 times 7. If you have a prime factor other than 2 or 5, then you have a non-terminating decimal. Notice this slide says a terminating decimal is easily located on a number line. Why? Because you can always find values that it's in between, and this is because it can be written as a rational number. If we're trying to represent 56 hundredths, right, we don't read that as 0 0.56, but 56 hundredths, then we can take a look at, for instance, 5 tenths and 6 tenths. Why? Because 5 tenths is 50 hundredths, 6 tenths is 60 hundredths, and that means 56 hundredths fits between those. As a matter of fact, we could list all these as the numerator over 100, and you can easily locate the decimal 56 hundredths. Now, can we find a decimal between two decimal values? So we're asked to find a decimal between 5 tenths and 6 tenths. So let's just write this in fraction form. So I've got 5 tenths and 6 tenths. We're going to try to find something in between. Now at first look, you know, there are no integers between 5 tenths and 6 tenths. But what if we change this to hundredths? So this would be 50 hundredths. Now, how did I do that? I just multiplied by 10 over 10, right? And then this one would be 60 hundredths. Can we find a decimal between 50 hundredths and 60 hundredths? Well, we certainly can. And the one right in between would be 55 hundredths. You know, we could keep doing that and doing that. We could always find decimal values. Could we find one between 50 hundredths and 55? Sure we can. What about halfway between 50 hundredths and 55 hundredths? Well, that would be 52 and a half. That's not really the way to handle it, right? So let's just look at these two. And let's multiply by 10 again. So 10 over 10 and 10 over 10. I'm not going to do the 60 because I'm not trying to find one in between there. So this would give me 500 thousandths and 550 thousandths. What would be right in the middle there? How about 525 
thousandths. Now, I never did write this decimal earlier. The one we found in the middle a minute ago, 55 hundredths, would be this decimal, 55 hundredths, and then in between 5 tenths and 55 hundredths would be 525 thousandths, which would be 0525. Now, if we ordered those, let's go to a different color here and order them. So, if I put them in order, remember 5 tenths was the lowest one, and then we found 525 thousandths, and we have 55 hundredths, and then we have that. So that's a list of what we found smallest to largest. And remember, the first thing we did was find this one, which was halfway between these two. And then we found this one, which was halfway between these two. Okay, so that's a method for finding decimals in between other decimals. How about comparing terminating decimals? How do we tell which one's bigger than the other one? The problem we just did, we knew which one was smaller and larger just because we kept fitting some in between. But the way to do this is to line them up. You could also write them in fraction form. But lining up the place value is a good way to go. If you're missing a place value at the end, it's not a problem whatsoever to place a zero to hold that position. So at the end here, we could even line the three up, but compare from left to right. So first compare the, the ones place, but those match zero. And if you had some to the left, you would compare left to right. Look, the tenths place matches, the hundredths place matches, but suddenly you see a difference between the thousandths place in the first one and the thousandths place in the second one. And since the first one listed is larger, then that top decimal is larger than that bottom decimal. So just compare, again, tenths, then hundredths, then thousandths, and when you have to go further, then do. So notice it says start at the left and find the first place where the face values are different. And that really, I feel like it should say the place values are different. I guess the face values is okay. Compare these digits. The number containing the greater face value in this place is the greater of the two numbers. The digits in the thousandths place are different. Definitely so. You got a six and a five. Six is bigger than five. So it's safe to say that, remember this would be 67,643 hundred thousandths is larger than 6,759 ten thousandths. All right, that wraps up my video. I don't even have a part two. So this is all for section 7-1. Come back again as soon as you can for section 7-2, and we'll continue to talk about decimals. Have a great day.